A woman's place is in the kitchen, pregnant, right? For many people in 2020, that statement smacks of misogyny and you'll be labeled a reactionary extremist if you say it. But before World War II, it was pretty much the general view across the globe and across the political spectrum. Welcome to Between Two Wars, a chronological summary of the interwar years, covering all facets of life, the uncertainty, hedonism, and euphoria, and ultimately humanity's descent into the darkness of the Second World War. I'm Indy Nidell. And I'm Anna Deinhardt. Anna's joining me in this episode as it sets the background for our new World War II in real time subseries on the home front, which Anna will host. Ain't that right? Yep, and I'll look at the rule in World War II for those that stayed at home. How the war affected families, everyday life, fashion, music, sex, the children, the elderly, and the role of women in the war machinery. And it will be awesome. That story starts, though, here in the interwar years. Well, also during the Great War, with greater empowerment, rights, and freedom for women. And then the counter-reaction to all of that. Now, in our episode, Sex, Drugs, and the Right to Vote, we looked at the political emancipation of women, and now we will look at the role of women at home and at work in the 1930s. In 1938, there are two characters that pretty much embody the opposite extremes of women's situation. First Lady of the United States, Eleanor Roosevelt, and the leading lady of the Nazis in Germany, Gertrud Scholz Kling. Bet some of you thought she was going to say Magda Goebbels. Oh, like two guys, probably. And no, no, Gertrude Scholz Kling is not Colonel Kling's wife, either. Anna, do you know who Colonel Klink was? No. Oh. oh, he's a famous fictional German World War II guy because we didn't have enough real ones. Long story, anyhow. It's not just people that illustrate the situation in the 1930s. Household appliances play an important role, like the automatic washing machine that is introduced this year in 1938. You know what? In March 1931, the first electric razor goes on sale in America. But this is an exception to the household revolution that is underway across Europe and the Americas. You see, most of the automation of our everyday life that picks up speed after the Great War is directed at stay-at-home women. Inventions like, like the pop-up toaster, electric stoves and ovens, the vacuum cleaner, electric washers and dishwashers are products meant to make life easier for the ones that do all the chores. Women. And now, one woman will seize on these new technologies to create more gender equality. Eleanor Roosevelt. Yes, maiden name Roosevelt, true story, is born in 1884 and marries her father's fifth cousin, the future president Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in 1905. Her family kept track of their fifth cousins. My family does not keep track of their fifth cousins. Now, if I, you know what, if I married my fifth cousin, I would never know that I had done so. Well, not until the two-headed baby. Anyhow, Eleanor Roosevelt, 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 Roosevelt is a modern, outspoken, and progressive woman. And also a reluctant wife and mother of six. See, when her husband is caught having a long-running affair with Eleanor's social secretary, and then he's hit with what is diagnosed as polio, but is more likely the autoimmune disease, Julian Barre syndrome, their relationship transforms into more of a political alliance. She campaigns alongside him, even stepping in as a surrogate when he's too weak. She inserts a very progressive gender equality component into Franklin's and her agenda. She sees inequality for women as a societal problem that endangers economic growth and improved standards of living. Confining women to the home is to Eleanor Roosevelt a loss for society. In 1933, during the Great Depression, she will write, if a woman wants to work and keep her home, let me ask you, Mr. Man, to help her and not to hold her back. She does understand, though, the importance of the core family, but believes that the home revolution can create both more sanitary and more efficient households to free women to contribute to society and work outside the home. It's progressive, but it's actually also a return to tradition. Women working both in and out of the home has been the standard for most of human history. Well, yeah, uh, outside of the upper and middle classes, so for most people, uh, the gender division in the Western world that Eleanor is now challenging is not that old in the 1930s. In fact, it's hardly a century old. Before the Industrial Revolution, the family unit in most parts of society is integrated as a whole, sharing the breadwinning. 
While there are gender roles based on physical capacity and ability, these roles are fluid and both sexes often work together or at least side by side. Adult women who were often, well, most of the time pregnant or nursing could still be an active part of that labor force. But, but don't get us wrong, this was not some, you know, utopia of blissful rural life, inequality and gender harmony. No, for most people, life was harsh. It was difficult, it was unforgiving, and it was much, much, much deadlier than modern times. But farming and cottage industries created a more or less gender integrated society, at least outside the cities. Now this changes when the factories come around. At first, women are actually the main workforce in these new factories, like in the big textile mills in Britain. But as production becomes heavier with longer work days, married women, again most of the time pregnant, become relegated to taking care of the young children and the household. At the latest, by 1850, this has cemented the core family of husband, wife and children, where the man of the household, and often the kids of the household, work for salaries while more and more mothers stay at home. So when the Industrial Revolution then goes into overdrive in the second half of the 19th century, and some workers start an upwardly mobile transition into professionals of the growing middle class, it is the men that make that journey while their wives are, figuratively speaking, chained to the stove. But already by 1900, some people are making plans to change that system for commercial reasons. They are the American utility companies, mainly the electricity providers. In 1900, utilities have already been working for several decades to light up the cities of America, first with gas and then with electricity, and to provide the growing American industry with power and running water. But by 1900, although those markets are not nearly saturated, the companies know that to keep growing, they need to expand their consumer base. In 1900, only 8% of US households have electricity and about 15% indoor plumbing, and that's mostly in the cities. By 1920, 35% have electricity. It is still unevenly distributed with more than half in the cities and only 3% in rural households. But you see, in the countryside, not everyone is so eager to get powered up. You need a reason to want these services and things seem fine to people in general as they are. So the companies need ways to create reasons. One way is to rely on local associations of housewives that you see more and more often in towns and the emerging new concept of suburbs. Electric companies provide select housewives with things like electric ovens to be tested and then demonstrated to other housewives. European countries follow suit and soon Magazines are full of ads showing happy, smiling housewives with slogans like electricity, electricity in, in every appliance. appliance. I can't believe you said that with me, thank you. <laughs> that are intended to convince husbands who still hold the ultimate decision on financial matters to make their spouses equally happy. That's so nice. But this does have the side effect of creating new kinds of salaried jobs for women. In 1917, for instance, the Public Service Electric and Gas Company of New Jersey creates an educational program to show women how to effectively manage the home. Gas and electric companies, manufacturers, home appliance producers, clothing firms, packaged food retailers, they now all start hiring female home economists. Now, as a percentage of the female labor force, this is not really significant, but they contribute to the reshaping of modern expectations of home life. The number of such departments in the US goes from 50 to 400 between 1925 and 1930. Again, European countries follow. In Germany, Berlin's electricity company, Bewag, set up an information center in 1924 and then a show kitchen in 1926 to demonstrate das elektrische Kochen. But let's not kid ourselves. This is all entirely an issue for the middle class and the upper class. Appliances are still too expensive for the masses. And it doesn't have any real effect on women as equals in society. In fact, in the 1920s, despite the youth revolution, the average woman is just as conservative on gender issues as men. As long as times are good, people are pretty happy with the status quo, or they want to go even further and turn back the clock to pure patriarchy, like the fascists in Italy and the Nazis in Germany. By 1932, one woman in Germany emerged as the advocate for less women's rights, Gertrud Scholz Klink. Born 1902, she has a brief career as a journalist before she marries her first husband, 
Eugen Klink, who dies suddenly in 1930, just after the couple have become active members of the Nazi party. In 1932, she remarries with Gunter Schultz. By now, she has started rising through the ranks in the party. Rising through the ranks? No. No, you're right. She is not rising through the ranks because as a woman, she cannot rise through any ranks in the Nazi party. Women, thank you, are prohibited from serving in official party functions and they cannot be members of the executive branch. What, what really happens is that Schultz Klink gets a role as the figurehead for Nazi policies for women. You can summarize these fairly easily, right? Women are an extension of their men and shall serve loyally, silently, and dutifully the cause of the German race. They shall be strong, but obedient, silent, but active, and they shall sacrifice all demands of individuality for the greater good of the race. Sure. Or, as Scholz Kling puts it, und das überfällt sie die tiefe Erkenntnis, was heißt denn Volk? Volk bin ich. Und dann versteht sie unsere nationalsozialistische Forderung, das kleine eigene Ich sich dem großen Du, Volk, unterordnen muss. The same goes for the men in the Reich, except women will have no say in how it will happen. After the Nazis take power, Scholz Kling becomes the head of their women's movement. Including the Bund Deutsche Mädel, the female equivalent of the Hitler Jugend. While boys will be trained to be good little soldiers, the girls will be trained to be good wives and mothers to bring the Führer children of the expansion of the race. Now, is it is it just me or did you suddenly get like a really strong German accent like right now? Totally. I can suddenly feel all this German anger inside my uterus. And on that happy note, this role as a passive subservient devotee is quickly quite popular with German women. Like many Nazi ideas, it's packaged in a gilded wrapping of euphoric dreams of a golden age to come. Like many Nazi ideas, it has little to do with reality. Between 1929 and 1932, this reality was, for many, rising unemployment. Women were especially hard hit. In 1925, nearly 12 million German women are active in the workforce. By 1933, this number has dropped to below five. That's well under half, right? The ideologues in the party want to keep it that way. So they introduce measures that will eliminate a large portion of these unemployed women from the statistics. One measure is a lump sum state credit paid out to men who get married. but only if the wife stays at home. Loan repayments are slashed for each child the couple produces. Women are also banned from most qualified professions that require a higher education. And women under 35 can no longer be appointed as civil servants. They are gradually being excluded from the workforce together with Jews and the politically undesirable. But when you start messing with an organic system, it can easily backfire. As we have seen in previous episodes, Germany is at the beginning of an economic recovery already before the Nazis take power. And now the workforce needs to grow again. On paper, the elimination of these sections of the population shouldn't be a problem since they don't even add up to the total unemployed number of men. But people are not just numbers. We have different educations, training and skills, and we're not all just movable. And even in Nazi Germany, people have personal preferences and might simply not want a certain job or a job at all. So Germany faces an asymmetrical deficit in the workforce already in 1934. In the countryside, the people that brought the Nazis to power are not affected by any of this. See, Germany is more agrarian than you might think. Over 30% of the workforce are in agriculture. And you can compare that to just 20% in the US and under 15 in Britain. This rural population is still socially organized like before the Industrial Revolution. Men, women, and children share in the farm work, and professional gender roles are fluid. For the Nazis, this is not a problem. After all, this is the dream. Rosy-cheeked German people and blonde, blue-eyed children doing character-building exercise while the grown-ups work for the lands of plenty in racial harmony. That is not, though, quite the reality of farm work. I'm pretty certain, actually. Anyhow, in the rest of the labor sectors, there's not enough people. And the Nazis quietly start rolling back some of their bans on working women. But one person who is not convinced is Schultz Klink. But she doesn't have a say. She is a woman, remember. Right. 
The male leaders now give her the responsibility for the female section of the Reichsarbeitsdienst. That finds unmarried young people for public works and to support the farming sector. Since Scholz Klink doesn't like the idea of working women, she sees it as a character building program for young women to later become good wives and mothers. Similar programs are launched in the US by the Roosevelt administration for young men and women in the National Youth Administration. Eleanor Roosevelt is now first lady and she is redefining the job. She is just as active in public as she has been while campaigning for her husband and the first to hold her own press conference. Her main causes are equal rights and bringing women back into the workforce. But, but here too, women face hurdles. Many businesses bar married women from employment. In 26 states, it's even against the law, with 18 of these states passing the laws during the Great Depression. And although women are not legally barred from most professions, 90% of women's jobs are in teaching and civil service for white women and domestic work for black and Hispanic women. And Asians? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Meanwhile, the first lady is busy making automation a real way to prosperity and new opportunities for women and their families. The creation of a model town, a planned community in West Virginia for unemployed mining families is her main project. With indoor plumbing, electricity, central steam heating and built-in appliances in all houses, it's a, it's a hyper-modern settlement. The project is decried as communism by the Republican opposition and is eventually a financial failure for the federal state. Just like communism. For the mining families though, it is, in their own words, utopia. More importantly, the world sees a new standard of ordinary living that could be available to everyone in some near future. In any case, if it is the first lady's advocacy, government programs, or just the nature of recovery, more women enter the workforce. So that by 1938, women's employment rates have risen significantly. To a lesser degree, the same goes for Germany, but it is now 1938, that in the US, in Germany and many other countries, things are really about to change for Magenda. If she is in fact a woman. Support us on Patreon if you'd like to find out. What? It is the specter of war that sets things off. By now, every nation is arming. Some aggressively like Germany, others clandestinely like the US. The armament industry is heating up so fast that the only way to keep employment steady is to let the women in. In 1938, the Nazis effectively abandoned most of their ideas on keeping married women out of the workforce. Although this increases the amount of employed women by 20% by 1940, it is still significantly below pre-Nazi levels because of the remaining restrictions on what kind of work they can do. In the US, 80% of single women and 15% of wives will be employed by 1940. At the time, a record number during peacetime. So, here in 1938, women have gone from having jobs in the Great War, getting a taste of independence in the 1920s, abandoning or being barred from it, and then started going back to work thanks to another pending war. Eleanor Roosevelt is getting some of what she wanted, more power for women for the good of both family and community. Gertrude Schultz Klink's vision of the devout, obedient woman at home is already failing. And from 1938 onwards, she is at best a marginal figure in Nazi Germany. And as 1939 rolls around, this is just the beginning of change that will transform and is still transforming society in the 21st century. The war will stop the progress of domestic automation dead in its tracks. But it will bring an unprecedented amount of women into the workforce. And although the post-war times will see a return to conservative gender roles for women in the West, it will be accompanied by another economic boom, partly driven by domestic automation and home electronics that for many will create prosperity and leisure time at levels humanity has never seen. The home revolution will be a cornerstone of the information age and ideas like gender equality, individual self-determination and independence will spread across the world. But to set that in motion will first take the sweat, blood and tears of hundreds of millions of women during six years of war. And that is what I will cover in On the Homefront. Which you will soon find on our channel World War II in real time. And you can always contact us at hotindy at timegoes.tv and hotanna at timegoes.tv. For me. For her. Yeah. And now? 
You go make me a sandwich. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. Thank you. Voiced by a Batmantle. Mm -hmm.